Hello, I'm Ben Godwin. Welcome to the Word Workshop recorded at the Good Springs Full Gospel Church. God of wonders beyond our galaxy. You are holy, holy. My wife Michelle and I have pastored the Good Springs Full Gospel Church since 1999. A spirit-filled church with a hunger for God and a heart for people. Good Springs Full Gospel Church is located in Walker County on Highway 269, 10 miles south of Jasper. The prophet said that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So prepare your hearts to receive from the Word, because when all else fails, God's Word works. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand to start to fall And all those lonely roads that I have traveled on It was Jesus When this life I built came crashing to the friends I had were nowhere to be found I couldn't see it then but I can see it now there was Jesus in the waiting in the searching in the healing in the hurting like a blessed buried in the broken This man who needs amazing kind of grace Forgiveness and a price I could pay I'm not perfect so I thank God every day If it was Jesus I 
Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. He was there all. Y'all sounding good singing this morning, and we might as well just sing one more congregation, all right? Y'all help me sing this song. Well, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. Yes, I'm on the battlefield for my Lord. I promised him that I, I would serve him till I Go with me in your Bibles, if you will, please, to the book of Matthew, chapter number 25. Matthew, chapter 25. We're going to dig into the Word in just a moment. I do want to show you a couple things. I went through the Chick-fil-A drive through and uh, you know that's, that's an ordeal. Man, they get you through fast, but there's a long line, usually to Home Depot. <laughs> but this is what they wrote on my bag. We will get through this. I thought, that, that's a good personal note. Look at somebody say, we're going to get through this. We're going to make it. God's bigger than that problem. Hallelujah. So have some, have some faith and confidence. I thought this was good. Billy Sunday said this. Going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to a garage makes you an automobile. Now going to church is important. It's part of it. But how many know that's not where it happens? It's in the heart. Amen. It's not about religion. It's about relationship. Uh, somebody posted this. I think, Joyce, you posted this. I thought it was good. God chooses the color of your skin, but you choose the content of your character. We have no choice where we're born and what family we're born. But we do have a choice about being born again into the family of God. Amen? Hallelujah. I like that. And this was hilarious. This lady done strapped the Bible to her face. She says, not today, Satan. <laughs> 
If you're looking for a mask to wear, what better mask or filter would that be than that one right there? Hallelujah. The Bible right there. I thought that was hilarious. Pretty good, huh? And then uh, one final one here. Somebody posted, I like this. It said, if 2020 were a pinata. <laughs> Crazy times, aren't they? Praise God. Well, go with me to Matthew 25. I'm going to use for a subject this morning, the parable of the ten virgins. The parable of the ten virgins. If I were to summarize this 13-verse parable in three statements, I would say this. Number one, there is going to be a wedding soon. Number two, it requires a lot of preparation. Number three, get ready and stay ready. That's it in a nutshell right there. Now the context of this passage is the continuation of what is known as the Olivet Discourse. In chapter 24, Jesus is on the Mount of Olives and he's sharing with his disciples 12 specific signs that will indicate the nearness of his coming. By my calculation, 10 of those are happening in the world right now. So that tells me we're getting closer. And it's in this context. There's no break between chapter 24 and 25. If you have a red letter edition Bible, it's obvious. It's a continuation. And so he tells this parable to illustrate the nearness of his coming and the need for us to be in a constant state of readiness. How many want to be ready for the coming of the Lord? And he uses a, a, an analogy or a parable here to convey that message. Let's read it. Matthew 25, 1. Then. Everybody say then. then. When? When Christ returns. He's talking about the signs of the last days and his coming. Then. When Christ returns, the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps, took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answer saying, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. And he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Heavenly Father, bless your word. It's already anointed, it, uh, anointed by the Holy Spirit. Now just open our eyes, our understanding. Illuminate our minds to receive it, to comprehend it, to apply it. In the mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said, Amen, amen and Amen. There are several times in the scripture where the med marriage metaphor is used. The creator of the universe is in love with us. Isn't that good news? Yes. Praise God. God is crazy about you. He is madly head over heels in love with you. Look at somebody and tell them, God loves you. Yes. Praise the Lord. Notice this. Notice that Jesus' ministry started at a wedding. John chapter 2, right? He turned the water into wine at a wedding. His ministry started at a wedding, but how many know it's also going to culminate at another wedding? Revelation 19 describes the marriage supper of the Lamb. Tell somebody, that's our wedding. Our wedding. Hallelujah. The wedding of the bride united with the groom. We shall see the king when he comes, the song says. So Paul used this marriage metaphor to describe the relationship between Christ and his bride. Let me show you some scriptures here. Ephesians 5, 31, 32. For this reason, a man 
shall be joined to his wife, and they two shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning who? Christ and the church. He's using an analogy, an illustration, or a comparison. Here's another couple of verses. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. See, in the natural, husband and wife come together, they become one flesh. When we're joined to the Lord, we become united in spirit with him. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, 2, for I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy, for I have been espoused to you, I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you a chaste virgin unto Christ. How many believe God wants a love relationship with his people? Too many people know God in a servant-master relationship. But I believe he wants us to know him not only as father and son, but a love relationship that's even deeper. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about this. Isaiah the prophet alludes to this, this marriage metaphor with these terms. Isaiah 62, 4, you shall no longer be termed forsaken, nor shall your land any more be termed desolate, but you shall be called Hephzeba, which means my delight is in her. And your land, Beulah, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. How many have ever heard that old song, Beulah Land, I'm longing for you? You know the word Beulah means married. And that's describing what it's going to be like in the new, new creation after the resurrection. God is going to be married to his people, the church. Praise God. Now look at this. I love this verse. The next verse in Isaiah 62 says this, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. Hallelujah. God wants a deep, intimate, meaningful, vibrant, passionate, ongoing love affair with his people. He's not looking, my friend, for uh, duty and obligation and drudgery and dead, dull religion and tradition and ceremony. He wants a living relationship with his people. Not about religion. Listen, religion is man's effort to reach God. It's about relationship. It's about Christianity, which is God's, relation, uh, God's effort to reach us. How many glad he made an effort to reach us? Well, if he made an effort to reach us, I'm going to make an effort to reach him. Yes. Amen? Glory. Now, let's make it a little more personal. We have been in wedding mode at our house for a few months now, right, Emily? Emily and Donnie's wedding, December 20th, is just six months away. The anticipation is building, but there's a lot of preparation that goes involved. The dress has been selected. Clothes have been bought. Cake has been ordered. A venue has been secured. The, photograph, uh, the photographer has been booked. Invitations, or the save me date, have been sent out. And there are thousands of other details that will just make your head swim. But Emily's been on top of it. She's very organized. And she is getting every detail planned and put in motion. My point is, there's a lot of preparation going on for this big special event. Well, how about this? Ladies, do you remember your wedding day? Like it was yesterday? <laughs> how much, long time ago, how much preparation did you put into it? How long did you stand or sit in front of that mirror? And you wanted to make sure your hair was just right. And you wanted to make sure your makeup was just right. And you wanted to make sure your nails were just right. And you, you wanted to make sure your dress, you wanted everything to look your best when you walked down that aisle. There was preparation going on. Well, I hope you're getting my drift. There's another wedding coming up. I said there's another wedding coming up between Christ and his church. And we are going through preparation. I don't know about you, I want my heart to be right. I want my attitude to be right. I want my motives to be right. I want my words to be right. I want my life to be right. Why? Because he's coming back for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, a bride who has made herself ready. I want to be ready when he comes. Amen? Now, let's, let's break down this parable just a little bit. First, we see that there were five foolish virgins. I believe they represent the professing church. 
The foolish bridemaids didn't plan ahead. They didn't take any extra oil for their lamps. Listen, that was their personal property, their own individual responsibility, and they dropped the ball. Wedding processions often occurred in the evening time or after dark. So not taking oil for your lamp is about like taking a flashlight with no batteries. It's about like making a trip and not charging your phone. It's a no-brainer. It should be done. And they dilly-dallied around and were caught unprepared. That's how a lot of people are going to be when Jesus returns. These five foolish virgins were distracted. They were preoccupied with other things, but they procrastinated when it came to the most important thing, being ready to meet the groom. There are a lot of professing Christians who aren't really taking life or eternity very seriously. A lot of people who claim to be Christians and they go through the motions. They know the church lingo. They hang around the things of God, but they don't have a heart after God. I don't know about you. I want a heart after God. Amen. So they're playing games. They, they, then when it comes, it's going to be total panic trying to put it all together at the last minute. Any procrastinators in the house? Anybody? You'll be, you'll be willing to fess up and admit that in church? <laughs> well, I got a statement for us. God guarantees forgiveness for our repentance, but he doesn't guarantee tomorrow for our procrastination. Second Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. The foolish virgins were good. After all, they were virgins. They were chaste. They were moral. They were virtuous. They were pure. But they were not ready. There's going to be a lot of good people who won't be ready when Christ returns. Jesus said this in Matthew 7, 21 through 23. He said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom but he that does the will of my father. He goes on to say, many will come to me and say in that day, oh Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these wonderful works? And he said, I will say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. There was no relationship there. It's not about the religious action. It's about relationship. Amen? So we got five foolish virgins. The only difference between them and the, and the wise is preparation, planning for the future. All right, here's the five wise virgins now. I call them the possessing church. Those who have a genuine relationship with God, they walk with him, they talk with him, they know him, they're truly living for him on a daily basis. They've planned ahead and they're prepared to meet God. Notice what the foolish said in verse 8. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise responded in verse 9, no, lest there should not be enough for us and you. This is going to sound a little strange, but hear me out. We cannot really share our salvation. I know that sounds a little strange. Oh, you can testify. You can witness. You can share the gospel. You can share you know, the love of God with people, but you can't transfer your salvation experience to somebody else. You've got to have your own experience with God. Every individual must have their own relationship with God. I like to say it this way. You're not going to get to heaven on anybody else's coattails. My grandpa and grandma were, were godly people. They loved God, were saved. My mom and dad, they were godly people. My dad's still living, 88. Godly people, but I will not get to heaven based on anything they did. I've got to have my own walk with God. Praise God. There's an old saying I like, God doesn't have any grandchildren. Just children. Because every person has to have their own encounter. How many are glad you've had an encounter with Jesus? Come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus told Nicodemus, one of the most religious men of his day, you must be born again. 
He didn't say it's a good, th a good thing if you're born again. He said you must. It is non-negotiable. It is absolutely mandatory. It's not optional. You must be born again. Look at this uh, quote by uh, Charles Spurgeon, one of the great preachers of a bygone era. He said, the scripture does not say you must be improved, <laughs> but you must be born again. Listen, the new birth is not an improvement of the old nature. It's an impartation of a new, new nature. It is not a superhuman work of man. It is a supernatural work of God. How many can testify and say, I've been born again? Born from above, born anew. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things pass away, and behold, all things become new. Got to have your own individual relationship with God. Notice this observation in verse 5. But while the bridegroom was delayed, notice what it says, they all slumbered and slept. Not just the five foolish ones. I call this the current condition of the church. But while the bridegroom delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Believe it, believe it or not, to some degree or another, the church has been asleep. We have been like a sleeping giant. But I believe God is working through circumstances to wake his church up. We have been like Samson, kind of nodding off, kind of drowsy and, and snoozing in the lap of Delilah, compromising with the world. But I believe there's coming a time when God is waking up his church. And what happened? What happened when Samson finally woke up? <laughs> He came to himself when he was in that dungeon and he cried out to God, God, move on me one more time. And he did more in his death than he did in his whole life. I believe the church is gonna do more in the closing hours as we approach the coming of Jesus than it's done in its history. Why? Because God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh and waking up his people. If you're close enough, elbow somebody and say, wake up. They all slumbered and slept. Not just the foolish ones, even the wise. And then notice what happened. When the wise were taken in, look at verse 10, the bottom part says, and the door was shut. The door of grace is now open, my friend. The door was shut. This was their custom. The door would be shut after all the invited guests arrived to prevent drifters and freeloaders from crashing the party. Go back to Genesis chapter 7, verse 16. You'll find out that when all of the animals, when Noah's family was in the ark and all of the animals were in the ark, what happened? God shut the door. Jesus said it this way, John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he shall be saved. He didn't say I am a door. He said I am the door. He didn't say I am a way. He said I am the way. He didn't say I am a uh, life. He said, I am the life. He didn't say, I am a truth. He said, I am the truth. The door of grace, the door of salvation is open. And right now, whosoever will, let him come. But there's coming a day when that door is going to be shut. But here's what people say. Here's what, how people think. Well, I'll get ready with God when I'm ready. Well, what if God's not dealing with you when you get ready? That's one of the devil's biggest lies right there. You got plenty of time. We're not guaranteed tomorrow, my friend. People say, well, I'll get right with God when I'm ready. Well, the Bible says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. If you feel the tug of the Holy Spirit on your heart, you respond to it right then and right there because he may not move on you again. The Bible says, my spirit will not always strive with man. But aren't you glad he's wooing you and he's drawing you? Hallelujah. Another, another deception that people have is they say, well, well, you know, I'll, I'll get right with God when I get my life straightened out. <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> you sing the song, Cody, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. You can't straighten your life up without Jesus. That's why he came. We need a savior. We can't save ourselves. We must have a savior. Hallelujah. Now, here's what I want to do. 
for my remaining time, I want to share with you some Jewish customs of marriage in Bible times that help kind of illuminate this parable, help us understand the cultural nuances of what was going on in that day. Here's how it worked. All right, The groom would travel to the prospective bride's house where the groom and the bride's father would negotiate a dowry. The Hebrew word for dowry is mohair. That's what I need, some mohair. <laughs> Just a joke. <laughs> Jewish marriages were usually arranged by their parents. Boy, our, our American culture sure balks at that, don't they? <laughs> Now listen, the idea is not that you're buying a spouse in, the, in that Middle Eastern culture in ancient times. In, in, in some parts of the world, there's still a, a dowry system that goes on. If you find a, a pretty wife, you might, get, uh, you might have to pay 10 cows. If you find a not so pretty wife, maybe five. I don't, I don't know how it all works. But the idea is not that you're buying a bride. The idea is you're compens compensating her father for the loss of a productive worker in his family. So they negotiate a dowry. That's how it worked in Bible times. The groom paid the agreed price and a covenant was established. This was known as espousal. An espousal was a binding agreement that could only be broken by formal divorce proceedings in the case of infidelity. Remember Mary and Joseph? When he found out she was pregnant, they weren't married. They were espoused. And he was not willing to put her away privately to divorce or, or to make her a public spectacle. He, he was going to put her away privately, but God intervened. They were only espoused. That shows you how binding that was. So the groom paid the agreed price. How many glad Jesus prayed, paid the price? He redeemed us. He ransomed us to himself with his own blood. All right. Then the bride was declared set apart. For her groom and a cup of wine sealed their betrothal. At the last supper, remember what Jesus did? He took the cup of wine and he said, this is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sin. We didn't understand it uh, in, our, in our Western thinking, but Jesus was actually sealing the espousal, sealing the marriage covenant. Hallelujah. Notice this. The groom would then return to his father's house for approximately one year to prepare their living accommodations, often just a room built onto his dad's house. Now, we balk at that. that. That sounds foreign to us in our culture. But remember what Jesus said in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. In my father's house are many, King James says, mansions. Other versions say rooms or dwelling places. He's been working on that place for 2,000 years. What kind of place do you think it is? Yes. Woo, hallelujah. I don't want to miss it. How about you? So when the accommodations were finished and prepared, then the groom would come back. Meanwhile, the bride prepared herself for married life. She knew the approximate time of the year the groom would return, but not the actual day. We've got a date set, December 20th. We know when it's going to happen. In ancient custom, they didn't know the exact moment. It was a big, it was almost a game of surprise and anticipation. Matthew 25, 13, here in the parable, look what he says. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. According to Jewish custom, the best man would lead the groom's entourage to the bride's house. The groom's arrival was preceded and announced with these shouts. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. I mean, the whole entourage of groomsmen and, and family, it was a big processional. They would start yelling and, and, and they would holler, behold, the bridegroom comes. Think about that in light of 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Jesus is coming back with a whole entourage of angels and saints, hallelujah, that will be announcing his coming. I heard one preacher say, and I liked it, if he's coming down with a shout, I'm going up with a shout. <laughs> hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Anybody excited about seeing Jesus? Anybody excited about the King of Kings coming back for you, for me, for his church, for the bride? Yes. Hallelujah. I like what uh, Barbara Johnson just said. Gabriel's going to toot and we're going to scoot. <laughs> After the wedding ceremony, the groom took the bride back to his father's house where they went into the bridal chamber. We would call it the master suite to consummate the marriage and enjoy. Listen, this will blow your mind. A one year honeymoon. Oh, brother Ben, I don't know about that. I got scripture for you. <laughs> Deuteronomy 24, 5, when a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, nor be charged with any business. He shall be free at home one year and bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. Honey, we only got one week at Disney World. <laughs> Actually, we traveled as, as evangelists for two and a half years, so it was ongoing, so praise God. For a whole year, he had to... He had to be prepared. He had to save his money, save his resources so that for a year he would not be sent out to war. He would be exempt from other things so that he could get to know his wife because they didn't date like we do in our culture. I didn't get any amens on that. All right, here's some points. I'm wrapping this up. Here's some points to ponder, all right? The 10 virgins were all good. Everybody say they were good. But they weren't all ready. It's not enough to be good. In fact, Romans 3, 12 says, there is none good, no, not one. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we could get good enough to go to heaven on our own, we'd get proud enough to go to hell. Not enough to be good. You gotta have Jesus. Hello, praise God. A couple other points here. The five foolish virgins, listen, this is very important. The five foolish virgins missed the marriage not for something they did, but for something they didn't do. There are sins of commission, sins that you commit, but how many know there are also sins of omission? James said this, therefore to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Let me ask you this morning, is there something we are not doing that we should be doing? It's a convicting question, isn't it? Notice this. This is really the heartbreaking part of the story. It says, afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Imagine this sad scene. The five foolish virgins have finally found some oil. Their lamps are now burning brightly again. Now they get back to where the marriage reception is going to take place. They're standing there knocking on the door. They, be they begin to knock feverishly and yelling, open to us, we're here, open to us. They can hear the celebration. They can hear the laughter, the music, the dancing, the singing, but the door is closed. They're on the outside wishing they were on the inside. I don't want that to happen to anybody that I know. Praise God. How many are glad he's opened the door? Get on the inside. Get in the ark and stay in the ark. Get in the house and stay in the house. Get, get saved and stay saved. Get right with God and stay right with God. Stay prepared and ready to meet the Lord when he comes. Jesus is coming. And he's saying this little parable, he shared this parable so we would stay in a constant state of readiness. Brother Ben, when is Jesus coming? Well, I've been studying the Bible over 30 years and I finally figured it out. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Help me now. Oh, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. So hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see. Stand and sing it with us. Oh, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king.
Hello everyone, this is Pastor Ben Godwin thanking you for watching our broadcast today. I pray it has been a blessing and a source of spiritual enrichment for you and your family. I'd like to invite you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can view many more singing and preaching videos. Search for Good Springs Full Gospel Church at youtube.com. Also, please visit our website at goodspringsfgc.org where you can learn more about our church and ministry, read many of my articles on a variety of subjects, find a direct link to our YouTube channel, shop our online store, and donate to our church and help support our TV ministry with debit, credit card, or PayPal. Also, you can mail in an offering the old-fashioned way to Good Springs Full Gospel Church, P.O. Box 3161, Jasper, Alabama, 35502. If we can assist you in any way in your spiritual journey, please contact us. And remember, when all else fails, God's Word works.